This is a production of Cornell University. Thank you so much, Jeff, for this invitation. It's really wonderful to be participating, and I uh, wish that I had been able to do this in person. Um, but unfortunately, our world has been turned upside down by the pandemic, but it's still lovely to be able to present this virtually. Um, so I'm going to kick start this um, by an introduction to the Cape Floristic region, and then I will move it along and um, ultimately discuss some of the plants that I actually work with in my particular environment. So I'm just quickly grabbing my pointer here. There we go. And I'm sure you might, much be, you must be well aware that the biodiversity in the world actually is not necessarily equally distributed, um, you know, throughout the whole entire world. And there are several different biodiversity centers and some of them actually are regarded as mega biodiverse centers, especially in terms of plant life. In South Africa, we have our national flower, the Protea cinoroides or the King Protea, which actually belongs to the one of the most dominant uh, groups of plants in, in the Cape, the uh, Proteaceae, together with the Ericas and even the Restios. And we also are home to three different biodiversity hotspots, the Cape Floristic region that has about 9,000 species in a very, very small area, and then the succulent Peru, which is a semi-arid area that has about 10,000 succulent species and is pretty much well-renowned for hosting the largest biodiversity of succulents in the world. And then the Maputo land, Ponder land, Albany corridor. And I'm going to try not to say this too many times because it is a little bit of a tongue twister. So I'll just call it the MPA. This particular region has about 1,900 plant endemics, and I'm going to now focus on these three different hotspots in South Africa. So the Maputo land, uh, Ponderland Albany corridor actually runs along the west, the eastern part of South Africa, which is actually bordered by the Indian Ocean. And that this particular environment is actually regarded as being semi-tropical, and the plants that you'll find there would be forest species, um, trees such as Erythrina, Caffra. There are also savannas that are chock-a-block full of different types of grasses, different meadows, and some, some shrublands. And this is pretty much where I originally actually did my um, studies before I moved down to the southern parts of South Africa and to the southern tip. And in the southern parts of South Africa, you've got two of these biodiversity hotspots. The one actually being the succulent Karoo, which stretches all the way right up to Namibia. And on this part of, of, of South Africa, you actually have the Atlantic Ocean, which is much uh, cooler in terms of its waters. And in the Cape Peninsula, right at the tip of Africa, the Indian Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean actually meet and they create a very interesting and unique uh, set of climates, which in some ways are thought to be involved in the spe species richness that is actually found right here in the southern tip. So some of the interesting plants that are actually found in the succulent Karoo happen to be Hudia goronia which is utilized by people and is exploited commercially as an appetite suppressant. But you also have interesting aloes, such as this uh, aloe tree that would be found in these semi-arid areas and the vilvichias that are punctuating the semi-arid semi areas that are sitting again in the succulent Karoo. So what about the plants that are actually sitting in the CFR or the Cape Floristic region? What do they actually look like? Well, these plants are very diverse in their character 
And most, most of them are actually highly endemic um, in nature. Interestingly, at the moment, the dyes are actually flowering. So a lot of different hikers and um, natural enthusiasts are actually making their way all the way up to Table Mountain to try and meet with these plants that are currently in flower. So the biodiversity that actually exists in the Cape Floristic region is thought to have been um, evolved as a result of many different factors. And some of the hypotheses that have been uh, proposed uh, are linked to the very landscapes that you actually find, find here and the different ecological niches that are actually part of the environment in, of the Cape Floristic region. Peter Linda in 2019 actually proposed that the radiation of the Cape flora was not necessarily due to a singular event, but might have been a mixture of older radiations and more recent radiations. So we don't currently know why this part of the world is so rich in a variety of different species. Some have thought that it may be the pollination syndromes that, that are existing here and the uh, uh, animal plant interactions might have actually driven adaptive um, evolutionary processes as well as convergent evolutionary pro processes might have actually been acting that might ultimately have resulted in the degree of this botanical gold that we actually have here on the southern tip. The environments can be very variable. So if you travel from Cape Town and you head out towards the semi-arid areas, like we did last year, you'll end up in a place called the Tankwa Karoo, and really it is pretty much desert. But when the winter fall comes, winter fall um, rains actually come, they ultimately lead to an explosion of uh, flowers in these succulents that are actually found in these particular areas. And again, this difference in climate and this interaction of the environment, the phenology of the plants is also thought to have been a very important driver of speciation in the area. There's also a very dominant fire regime that has also thought to have been involved in actually driving speciation in this area. And the fane boss or the fine bush, which happens to be this shrubby vegetation type that actually dominates the Cape Peninsula is very fire dependent. This afternoon, this whole set of mountains where I actually live was actually covered in smoke and the fire season is really on at the moment. And these fires actually bring not only um, the heat, but also the smoke itself is very important for the germination of those species. So these life strategies that have been evolved by the plants around this region are also thought to be important for the establishment of the species that are actually found here. Interestingly enough, we also have snow in South Africa in certain parts of South Africa. So in the mountains of the Cape, you will often see, you know, snow caps and sometimes the fame boss actually gets covered in that snow and the drops in temperature, the moisture that's actually brought on by the snow is actually probably also quite important in triggering um, flowering of the winter uh, dependent um, species. In other parts of South Africa, in places such as Hawksback, which is very close to where I was actually born, you have quite a deep amount of snow that will actually settle in those areas. And I put this um, particularly because um, Jeff and I have been sharing about, you know, the differences in the climates um, here in the south versus in the north at this particular time. 
And this uh, picture is taken in Hawksback. And some of the plants that are actually found there, because that area belongs to the NPA, happen to be beautiful um, species of the Iridaceae, as well as the Streptococcus um, species are actually found in these particular regions. So these variable geoclimatic conditions are also thought to have driven speciation in this part of the world. Also, the soils are ancient, especially in the Cape Floral region. And these ancient soils are low in, nit in nitrates and they're low in phosphates. And so plants around this region have really acquired very intricate mechanisms in, in order to be able to maximize on their min mineral nutrition, such as the cluster roots, which are, are, are produced by uh, the proteas that actually facilitate the acquisition of nutrients. And as you can see, this is actually a picture that was taken last year. Um, and uh, we were all masked up while we went into the field. Uh, but it was a really fun time because we saw many proteas that were flowering. And at the same time, we also got to meet with these cluster roots that are, are, are an important mineral nutrition strategy for proteaceae. And the plants in this part of the world are really quite variable. You will have the succulents, such as these mistonias, for example, that actually utilize thorny strategies to defend themselves against herbivores. You also have droseras that are reliant on um, animals in order to provide them with nutrition and different species that have become horticulturally important, such as the bruniers and some species that are of medicinal value, such as this elephant's foot, and even different species that are of ornamental um, interest that serve as inspiration for landscape artists. The plants are variable, they are quite beautiful, and many of these species serve as a very important part of the bioeconomy of South Africa. So the people of South Africa are also quite diverse. There's a very rich social and cultural biodiversity, which in itself actually matches the plant biodiversity. So at this particular juncture, I'd just like to bring a little bit of history in terms of how this sociocultural biodiversity came about. In, in fact, the original of the southern tip of Africa happened at some stage they were actually joined by who came through central parts and ultimately towards um, the southern tip and then in the 16 1700s the Dutch settlers started to actually settle um, around this area and the Brits came around the 1800s bringing together with them a slave trade that brought to to, to this part of the world, people from the East. And this has created a very unique and a very diverse um, ethnopharmacopoeia. And so people exploit this biodiversity for many different reasons, and they connect this exploitation to their histories. So different people are actually found in South Africa as I indicated. And this then leads to a different set of indigenous knowledge systems. If you are uh, in the NPA area, you will meet Zulu people and Sangomas. That's a Zulu word for a traditional healer. But then if you travel towards the Cape, you will actually meet up with Amagrika, which happened to be of Kosa origin. But right in the southern tip, the bush doctors or bossy doctors in Afrikaans are the main commodifiers of 
herbal medicines that are actually um, uh, herbal plants that are actually found in, in this part of the world. And all of these different cultures have got different indigenous knowledge systems, which they claim connects them to their ancestors. And they actually bring this history into a contemporary context. Most of this material is actually harvested in the wild. And this, of course, does cause an extinction threat. And species such as this uh, wild African ginger or Siphonochylus is actually um, in, extinct in the wild. But that type of wild harvesting of medicinal plants in South Africa is not the driver of plant extinctions. It is mainly expanding urban developments, expanding agricultural um, development, invasive species, and all of these anthropogenic activities are actually driving plant extinctions in this particular part of the world. Even so, the exploitation of plants by people is a very deep culture. It is an oral practice that is actually linked to the informal trade of medicinal plants. Many of these plants are actually collected in the wild and then brought into urban centers and traded as part of a livelihood generation for about 60 to 70% of the population. At the same time, there is a formalized trade of medicinal plants that has led to a variety of different phytopharmaceutics that are not necessarily only sold in South Africa, but are actually sold globally, such as an extract that is made from Pelagonium pseudoides that is manufactured for um, as a respiratory um, uh, treatment. And it is called Umka Cold Care in the United States. And it goes by you know, different uh, trade names in different parts of the world. And of course, rooibos or Aspilathus linearis is cultivated, but at the same time, there is some wild harvesting that actually still takes place in order to service this phytopharmaceutics um, industry that is a growing industry in South Africa. So in our particular environment, we are interested in the plants that are exploited by people that have not necessarily been well studied, but at the same time, we are also interested in plants that are actually commercialized or have a commercial potential. And we utilize a diverse range of scientific tools that are linked to biotechnological um, strategies. Some of these involve second generation biotechnology, such as plant tissue culture, but we also utilize third generation biotechnology, where we actually alter the uh, genetics of these plants. And we use a metabolomic set of pipelines that actually facilitate us to be able to understand what is actually happening to the chemistry, whether we are looking at plants that may be collected in the field or plants that are in cultivation, as all of that hopefully allows us to be able to tell us a bit deeper about what might be happening at the physiological, biochemical, and even genetical level within the actual cell. So at this particular stage, I actually wanna move the discussion to discussing some of the plants that we actually focus on in my particular laboratory. So the first species that I'd like to talk about is one that is becoming a firm favorite for me. And this is Skeletium tortosum from the um, family Mesembranthiniaceae. It grows in the succulent Karoo, and it is one of eight different species within the Skeletium genus. It is the only species at this particular stage that has been commercialized, and it has been commercialized for a set of mesembrine alkaloids 
that are known to have a central nervous system acting um, in animal tissues. So um, we are a little bit worried about this particular species because it's becoming quite popular as a commercialized product. But even in popular culture, uh, people are starting to um, exploit this particular uh, plant because it does give you a sense of euphoria if you chew on this um, leaf material or you take it as an extract. So there are some conservation concerns um, with, with, with regards to this, with um, people actually collecting plants um, in the wild. But at the same time, we also want to service the commercial um, industry around Skeletium with some of the work that we've actually been doing. So just to give a background, Already in, um, in the 1600s, Simon van der Stel actually foresaw the potential of this particular species. When he went on a set of explorations in the Cape Floristic region and even in the succulent Karoo, and he met up with the Kwekwe and the sand people, and he found them actually consuming this particular plant for religious and spiritual purposes. And it is only in the 1970s that the mesembrines were actually first isolated um, from these particular plants. And this research um, took on a positive trajectory from the 1990s. And it is only really now that we are starting to understand what these mesembrine alkaloids and particularly mesembrine is actually acting in animal models. We do know that it is able to bind to brain receptors and it has an anti-anxiety effect. It does increase concentration and it is actually being um, also commercialized as an antidepressant and it is included, included in a variety of different products at this particular stage. So we did a study which looked at a single isolated population that actually occurs in the Cape Nature Reserve that is actually called Kamchaberg Nature Reserve. This is between two small towns that are known as Kalitsdorp and Otsuren, and these are positioned in the succulent Peru. And we focused on this particular population because it was actually a occurring as a single isolated population with the plants actually clustered on, a, on a, a single slope. And when we go out into the field, we noticed several different things. One of the things that we noticed is that these plants are always hidden. We don't know if they hide themselves to prevent animals from actually seeing these plants and um, preventing herbivory or is it for a UV protection purpose, purpose? Or is it because they are actually able to get a little bit of shading from the highlight intensities that are prevalent in these areas? Or is it perhaps due to the fact that they actually acquire uh, water that actually pools amongst these other plants that they actually hide underneath? So we collected plants um, in the wild and then we monitored them over different seasons. And then we also established a cultivation strategy that I'm going to talk about um, as I proceed with this particular research that we conducted in Skeletium. So the first interest was to actually look at different seasonal effects. We looked at um, uh, plants that are collected during the autumn solstice, the winter equinox, the spring solstice, and even the summer solstice. And we measured a whole bunch of growth production parameters. And what is actually interesting is that even the different um, positions of the buds actually has an impact on the metabolites. And depending where these buds are actually positioned, you have increased production of beta lanes um, during different seasons. 
What about the mesembrines? The mesembrines really alter quite significantly. Mesembrine itself as an alkaloid start to, starts to accumulate at higher levels in plants that are actually um, growing in spring. But in summer, many of these mesembrine alkaloids that we actually monitor start to increase in their production. And their accumulation seems to be um, developmentally regulated as well as having a spatial and temporal regulation. And so we were interested to better understand how these mesembrine alkaloids are actually distributed in different parts of the plant at different times. And so we set up a tunnel experiment where we started growing clones of mesembrine that we, or, or skeletium that we had um, established. And then we monitored mesembrine alkaloids in the apical meristematic tissue, in different tissues that were different developmental stages. So leaf one is actually one of the youngest leaves, whereas leaf six is starting to senesce and generating the skeletons that actually shield the inner leaves of um, the plant. And we also looked at stem chemistry in terms of the mesembrines, as well as analyzed the axillary buds to better understand what was actually happening in that particular tissue type. We were able then to establish some patterns after using multivariate statistics. And this looks quite complicated, but I'm gonna try and keep it quite simple. So for example, the stem tissues started to increase production of a wide range of mesembrinol isomers. And interestingly enough, mesembrine itself um, started to actually um, accumulate in another tissue type where the much younger leaves actually seem to start to express um, um, a different amounts of different isomers of mesembrinol, but then at the same time, these also seem to appear to have much higher levels of mesembrine. And the stem tissues themselves also actually do accumulate at certain stages much higher levels of mesembrine. I keep emphasizing on mesembrine itself because the industry that produces the phytopharmaceutics of skeletium actually monitor mesembrine um, and about four other alkaloids are also monitored, but they are, have a very deep interest in mesembrine itself. So I'm just going to play a, an animation here and I want you to basically track this um, arrow that focuses on mesembrine at different um, stages of uh, leaf development, going from the apical meristematic tissue, looking at the development of, of, of the mesembrine in terms of its relative um, abundance, and it ends off at the axillary meristematic tissues. So I'm just gonna play this animation and we start off with apical meristematic tissue and different tissue types. You can see that mesembrine um, biosynthesis is actually changing in different types of the tissue. We are able to monitor a variety of different mesembrines. And what's interesting is that the pathway of biosynthesis of mesembrine is still pretty much unknown because our information is based on Jeff's papers, which were actually published in the 1970s. We still have many different questions that we don't understand in terms of the relationship of different types of mesembrinomes, for instance, with each other. Um, we also don't know, for example, where this mesembrinol might necessarily be derived. 
Is it coming directly from mesembrine or are there other different kinds of precursors that are actually leading to this particular mesembrinol? And we still have many questions in terms of how this biosynthesis is actually regulated genetically. Um, and we still have many different questions that are, are actually in our, in our minds with regards to whether these metabolites are actually being moved from the apical merist meristematic tissues and suddenly deposited in the older leaves and even, even in the stems. So there are many different questions which we still need to answer with regards to the synthesis and the, and the spatial and temporal regulation of mesembrine alkaloid biosynthesis. At the same time, the extracts themselves are not necessarily well characterized because many different alkaloids are still not necessarily known to us. So we think that better characterization of these extracts will facilitate us to be able to um, have a better understanding of the biochemistry of mesembrine alkaloid uh, metabolism, but at the same time will actually facilitate the commercial um, industry to provide an extract that is well understood in terms of its chemical character. At the same time, there's much information that's actually lacking in terms of the contribution of the minor constituents, which have not necessarily been resolved in terms of their central nervous system acting um, processes. So in our labs, we have been quite, um, serpent, uh, quite lucky in actually establishing a, a tissue culture system, which um, is based on a callus production, but also um, facilitates the production of micro, sh micro shoots. What's quite interesting about these callus cultures that we have in our laboratory is that they continue to produce a variety of different mesembrine alkaloids, even though there is no formal organization of the tissue. And this is quite unusual uh, because often these very sophisticated metabolites actually require some kind of organ formation in order to be able to accumulate. We think that this type of system might be an easier system to industrialize when we actually set up bioreactors that may become an alternative source of mesembrine alkaloids. That kind of culture system might actually alleviate pressure on wild populations, but at the same time provide more standardized and quality assured extracts for the industry that is exploiting skeletium biodiversity. So there are many questions that we still don't know. And some of the questions that we are interested in is actually getting a better understanding of the chemical and genetic diversity in terms of skeletium as a genus. We are also interested in understanding whether the other species of skeletium have any pharmacological activity whatsoever. And whether that chemical diversity is actually matched to the, to the bio, bio, bioactivity and then to better understand the modes of action of these different extracts that we might actually generate from different species of skeletium. So I wanna bring on a second example at this particular stage. And this example is linked to a legume, a South African legume known as Sutherlandia fructescens that is found in the Cape Floristic region, but actually also occurs in other different biomes such as the MPA biome and even in the succulent karoo. This particular species um, has been a species that we've been studying in my particular environment for quite a few years now, 
utilizing both biotechnological strategies, as well as again, this eco-metabolomics um, approach that we use in our lab. So we've been interested in both centralized metabolism and even specialized metabolism in terms of this particular plant. And I will today talk about a set of experiments that we actually did um, that look at uh, mineral uh, nutrition in this particular species. Before I do this, I just wanna give a little bit of background with regards to this particular plant. It's regarded as a multifunctional herbal remedy that has been commercialized and continues to be exploited by um, local people. It has a long history in terms of its medicinal use, and it is actually called in Afrikaans kanker bush or cancer bush, and it is claimed to have been utilized by the Aboriginal people actually as a treatment for cancer. Today, it is regarded as a anti-diabetic uh, treatment, and it is also used to relieve stress. And at the same time, it has been commercialized for um, you know, many different other reasons, which I'm not necessarily gonna go into today. And agricultural production is actually happening at a small scale, and there is still a reliance on wild collections. We first at, uh, did a study together with Elaine Houston's from the Flanders Institute of Biotechnology at the University of Ghent, where we uh, used a genetic strategy to alter um, uh, secondary metabolism. The work that we did with Elaine involved a single peptide, which was discovered in his particular laboratory that's known as Taximin. It is a single peptide, which was thought to um, alter secondary metabolism. And at the time when we were doing this work, its function in plants was largely uncharacterized. This project uh, re resulted in us exploring the effect of the single peptide in um, Arabidopsis, as well as in Sutherlandia frutescens. In Arabidopsis, the overexpression of this peptide actually causes a wide diversity of different morphotypes that are uh, quite um, abnormal. And somehow the overexpression of this particular peptide is thought to actually function at the morphological level in terms of Arabidopsis. It doesn't alter secondary metabolism significantly, but there are minor alterations in terms of primary metabolism. So we thought then that perhaps the same effects in Sutherlandia might actually occur as a result of overexpression of this particular taximin signaling peptide. So we explored this in our laboratories and uh, using a hairy root culture system that had been set up in my lab. And ultimately we then did a variety of different treatments where we treated with methyl jasmonate to induce secondary metabolic events. We looked at um, non-transgenic um, plants that had been generated from these hairy roots and also explored uh, transgenic roots that had been treated with methyl jasmonic acid. What was quite interesting was that a diversity, again, of different morphological uh, traits that was associated with these hairy roots were quite obvious. And at the same time, the main compounds that are found in Sutherlandia, Sutherlandia sides, which actually happen to be cycloartin glycosides, these are terpenoids, and even uh, interesting flavonoids that accumulate in, Sutherland in Sutherlandia were differently produced in the different uh, transgenic cultures that we had actually generated with this 
taxamine overexpression, as well as the methyl jasmonic acid treatments. So it was then quite clear that taxamine might have different regulatory roles in different plant species. And so that particular study then also led us to exploring what might actually be, be um, the type of chemical diversity that might actually be out there in nature. Because we had actually at that particular stage utilized plants that had actually been isolated or e extracted from populations in the Western Cape. So we went out into different parts of uh, South Africa. The plants are, are in red here actually collected from areas of the succulent Karoo, and these were actually compared to the Western Cape uh, populations. And the plants that are indicated in yellow actually grow in this area that's uh, part of the NPA. And it was quite clear that plants that came from different regions actually expressed a different chemical character. What was also very interesting was that these plants had different types of bioactivity. So plants that are actually found in the Karoo area have got anti-cancer bioactivity, whereas plants that are actually growing in the Western Cape, particularly in coastal areas, have got high levels of antioxidants. And so we think that it would be better for uh, the industry to choose specific chemotypes for a specific and particular bioactivity. So we had this hypothesis that the differences in the chemical character might actually be linked to the different environments where these plants were actually found. And so we then explored um, a tissue culture based system where we actually changed the amount of phosphates and then we also changed the amounts of nitrates in a controlled tissue culture environment. What was quite obvious was that the different treatments that were uh, associated with low phosphate or, or even low nit nitrate, nitrates actually resulted in a difference in amino acid uh, signatures that are actually found in, in the treated plants. Some of the compounds that were actually expressed at much higher levels or increased in terms of their relative abundance actually happen to be the, the sugars. And these types of sugars are actually very important in stress responses as a whole in plants. And also um, specific metabolites such as spermine, um, asparagine and GABA are all important in facilitating plants to be able to cope with stress. At the same time, we conducted a proteomic analysis of the treated and untreated plants and many different proteins that were increased in terms of their relative uh, abundance were associated with primary metabolism, um, such as photosynthesis proteins, glycolysis proteins, proteins that are involved in nitrogen and TCA um, pathways, heat shock proteins that are well known to assist plants in coping with stress, as well as structural proteins. And many of these proteins that are being expressed in terms of central metabolism actually facilitate um, the production of precursors that ultimately lead to the biosynthesis of specialized metabolites such as the valandiocytes and even soya saponins. So it's, it, 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 is, it might be possible that these different environments that are actually found in um, the wild might be causing differential expression of different pathways that ultimately lead to a variable production of different compounds. For example, the Sutherlandiocytes are thought 
to be responsible for the anti-cancer activity of these plants, whereas the flavonoids, for example, actually facilitate ROS activity um, in plants. And some of these uh, uh, flavonoids that are produced are general uh, fat flavonoids, camphorol derivatives, uh, charcoals, and even Sutherlandioside um, and Sutherlandin isomers, which we think might be functioning ecologically to assist the plant cope with its actual environment. So where to from here with Sutherlandia? We would really be interested in understanding trans transcriptomic changes that are as a result of these different um, micro, -environment, micro environments. The taxonomy is also um, a little bit um, confusing because some people have said that plants that are found in the Northern Cape might actually be micro, uh, microphylla, whereas uh, plants that are found in the Western Cape are actually um, a, a, a different um, a variant. So it may be interesting to apply some kind of genetic analysis to, to try and actually resolve some of, the, some of these um, genetic questions which we're now starting to have um, in our heads. I want to bring on a, a, a a fairly new project that we've been working on here. And this one is linked to a species that's actually a pandemically distributed species that is known as a Dodonea viscosa, viscosa. And here we set up a wild, um, a, a wild uh, analysis of plants in terms of their chemistry, but at the same time, we set up a common garden experiment because we wanted to minimize the effects of the environment. And then we did a population genetic structure of wild, uh, wild plants. And I will talk a little bit about that work as well. This work was actually based on a study that was collected with Kate Bush Doctors uh, Organization and Anna Marit Engelbrecht, who is a human physiologist that specializes in cancer, where we uncovered anti-cancer activity that was actually linked to a breast um, cancer cell line. So different populations of this species have got variable anti-cancer activity and that anti-cancer activity is actually associated with a variety of different apoptotic markers. These plants also have anti-angiogenesis activity which might assist in um, the non-migration of the cancer to different parts um, um, in, in, in patients. So we would like to commercialize this particular extract as an adjuvant treatment, which would be utilized together with other anti-cancer chemotherapy. And we ultimately would like to move it from the laboratory uh, desk and ultimately onto the pharmacy shelf. So, I'm going to talk about some of the work that we did in, term of the, in terms of the chemical diversity and the genetic diversity with regards to this particular um, species. So we've collected plants from different areas. The Cedarburg is a mountain area. Stellenbosch also has some mountains, but it's also quite close to the sea. And then uh, the Hoop that actually sits in a coastal area. And all of these different environments have got different uh, geographical uh, types. And then at the same time, the climates are actually very different. So the wild population plants actually cluster into two different um, types, um, with the Cedarberg type actually clustering um, uh, into two different clusters. And then the Dehwap and the Stellenbosch types actually clustering together into two different types. And what's interesting is that when we grow these in a common garden experiment, similar types of patterns are actually ob uh, observed. So this led us to thinking that perhaps 
the plants might not necessarily be, be having a phenotypic plastic response, but this might actually be related to differences in population structure. So we conducted a, a, a population genetic um, 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 analysis based on some microsatellites because we thought that um, these plants might actually not necessarily control their metabolism in a phenotypic plastic manner, but it might actually be a genetically inherited um, difference. And so that microsatellite analysis was actually quite interesting for us because it mirrored the, the chemical types that we actually saw. The cedarberg populations, again, were genetically uh, different, whereas the Stellenbosch and the Dehua plants were similar in terms of their population genetic structure. We think that the cedarberg might actually be acting as a genetic barrier, um, and there might be greater gene flow between the Stellenbosch population and the Dehua plants because these plants actually are pollinated by insects, small insects that can't travel long distances. But on the other hand, um, there might be better uh, gene flow between the Stellenbosch populations and the Dehuop populations rather than the Cedarberg populations. What was also quite interesting is that in this common garden experiment, the ecophysiological data again mirrored the chemical data as well as this population genetic uh, data that we had generated. So finally, I get to my last um, example where uh, I include, included this specifically because several people that are listening to this talk were involved in this um, grant proposal that um, Jeff was talking about initially. And I'm gonna share a little bit of um, Jolene Brooks's data um, in this particular time. So rooibos is a very well-known tea. It's um, commercialized in all different parts of the world. I drank a lot of rooibos when I was at, at the University of Minnesota. Um, it made, it reminded me of home. And, um, and also I think it generally just kept me feeling happy and healthy. This particular species is not necessarily just um, commercialized for uh, its tea, but all kinds of different products are made, including wine, where they use it as a woodification system to actually mature the wine. A whole bunch of products such as cosmetics are generated from rooibos. And in South Africa, it's even used um, to fortify bread. Um, so it really has multi uh, different uses in industry. So Jolene went out into the different parts of the Cedarberg and the Northern Cape. And these are actually part of the Cape Floristic region. And she collected rooibos together with the local people who know very deep information about wild rooibos. And different ecotypes of rooibos actually exist in the wild. And interestingly enough, these different populations of rooibos somehow seem to cluster according to site, with the Cedarberg populations actually clustering together and the Northern Cape populations clustering in two different um, quadrants. So three different clusters were actually um, obvious in terms of the wild rooibos that we collected. And again, many different compounds whose chemical identity actually remains unknown. The um, analyses that we did where we used um, a chloroplastic uh, a set of uh, primers to interrogate a little bit of the historical um, um, origins of these populations. Um, actually led to four different um, haplotypes uh, being, um, being detected. And 
Then we then also utilized some um, nuclear um, markers. And interestingly enough, we didn't get very good resolution when we actually did, when we did a PCOA, but when our analysis was a little bit more supervised with a, 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 a DPAC, um, different populations could actually be, be, be resolved into different, um, based on different sites. So, um, Jolene um, hypothesized that this genetic difference might actually be linked to whether these plants are reseeders or resprouters, um, because um, some of the populations are actually using a different um, strategy in terms of their reproduction strategies. So the plants that are occurring in the, in the, in the, Northern, in the Northern Cape um, actually are mainly known to, to be resprouters, whereas the cedar bird populations are actually using a different strategy. So we really would like to delve a little bit deeper into this kind of analysis, um, include a much wider set of uh, nuclear markers, collect much larger um, sample sizes, and actually expand this ultimately to different species of um, Spilathus genus, and hopefully we'll be able to do this at some stage in the future. So again, there's a lot of information that we still don't understand with regards to um, Aspilophus linaris itself. And I hope that I've been able to share some interesting aspects with respect to, my, to the work that we actually do here, and that there's still a lot of value in using interesting scientific tools to mine the biodiversity of South Africa, at the same time to add a new value to indigenous knowledge that it exists here and hopefully to grow the bioeconomy for South Africa and its people. I'm happy to take questions. If we have them, I'd like to thank you for your attention and many other people that have assisted me in the work that I've actually been doing here at Stellenbosch. Happy to take questions. Thank you, Knox. Thanks for a very nice seminar. Uh, I have one question in the chat. Christopher Dunn, Christopher um, writes, is there any benefit sharing so that some of the commercial profits are returned to the relevant indigenous communities? Yes. Um, so there is a lot of uh, benefit sharing that is actually um, taking place. And I'm going to just sketch the scenario and take you back to 2004. Um, in 2004, um, the South African National Biodiversity Act um, actually added two new chapters to it, which stimu stipulate that any indigenous knowledge that is exploited and ultimately commercialized um, needs to have the original indigenous knowledge holder uh, benefit from those bioprospecting activities. And this is actually legislated and the Department of Environmental um, Affairs in South Africa, which is a government department actually monitors this. So for all the work that I do, I actually have to declare to, to the government in terms of the work that I'm proposing to do. And if any innovation is derived from it, then, and that innovation is protected through a, a, a patent and the patent becomes licensed and any commercialization ultimately takes place from those activities, communities that have been the providers of that information need to benefit share. And the government actually monitors this and the funds go into the, a, a government pool, which then flows to the different communities that are actually associated as beneficiation partners. It's, it's quite difficult because some of this knowledge is actually community knowledge that comes from old. So it's very difficult to identify the, 
the original knowledge holder. Okay. Thanks, Knox. Christopher, do you have any follow-up questions about that? Uh, no, I don't, but thanks for asking, Jeff. That was very, very well put. Thank you. Thanks. Are there other questions? We're a little over time, so I, I'm going to not have too many more, but uh, if anybody else would like to ask one. I have one question, Knox. Um, are there many genera that have species in uh, more than one of these uh, regions of high endemism and radiation? So for example, uh, species, different species in the succulent Karoo and the uh, Cape Floristic region. Um, can you repeat that for me again, Jeff? So are there many other genera that have, men, have species in more than one of these uh, high diversity regions, like for example, the core Cape Floristic region and the succulent Karoo? Um, yes, yeah, absolutely. So um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, it, it's, it's really quite, um, so quite interesting that you know, some of the some of these plants are, are not necessarily just located in the, in these areas, but they've actually kind of um, radiated like throughout the whole entire country, for example. Mm -hmm. So they they actually found you know in many other different um, areas apart from these, I would say, hot spots. It's just that they may be concentrated in some of these hot spots. Um, in terms of their, um, their, their numbers. Okay. I don't know if, if that kind of answers you. Yeah, it does. I mean, I'm, I'm interested in thinking about if there are cases like that, whether there are uh, patterns in the chemistry that would be typical that you'd see repeated over and over again as you go from a genera that uh, have species in the different regions. So there are generalizations about the chemistry that, that would be there as well sort of a follow-up to that. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, Ariel Johnson, Ariel, you've got a question. Yeah, um, thanks for the awesome seminar. Um, I'm really curious uh, if the mesembrine in the scaladium, um, if it's like co concentrated in any of the cells, like um, like beyond the organs, like if, if you happen to know, because uh, sort of like the bladder cells or like other idioblasts or um, I'm, I'm just curious uh, if that might be the case. I guess the fact that in the culture um, it's still able to produce the compounds might indicate that it's not. Um, but I was curious if you're investigating like the cellular localization of these compounds. So we at this stage haven't actually done any of that kind of um, analysis. Um, where we actually sort of take a, you know, a, a, a piece and then kind of strip it away and actually look at, at, at that analysis. We haven't even done any um, analysis just to even understand um, some of the primary steps because this mesembrine is actually synthesized from tyrosine. So we might be able to use some of the primary steps um, that are actually common to beta lane synthesis to try and maybe see where it might be produced. But at this particular stage, we haven't actually done any of that kind of work. I, I, I'm, I'm thinking in my mind, it might be nice to feed um, radio labels and then kind of track them and see what, what's going on. But that could be a, a fun experiment, but we haven't done it yet. Well, thank you. All right. Well, I think we'll, we're losing our audience because I think we're people have to go to meetings and things like that. Chelsea Speck wrote and thanked you for a wonderful seminar, but she had to leave. And so I want to thank you again, Knox. That was a lot of fun and uh, good luck. And I hope we'll be in touch about the, the Rooibos projects as well. Yes, thank you very much right. for the input. And um, I look forward to some more interactions. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.